You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Hey, it's Dave and Josh. Welcome to the Study Bible portion of the Video Bible. So let's jump right in and look what's happening in this verse. So Josh, this verse looks like from where is a continuation on last week, just as this verse is a continuation of the verses we talked about before. And so we have here the man with the knife. He's greeted by a friend of the world, and it looks like they are going to plan together evil desires that is born out of envy. One interesting thing about this is my dad always told me good advice. It's advice that I should have listened to early in life. Hmm. I did not. And it said, son, the best way to stay out of a bad situation is to not be there in the first place. Hmm. So when I look at this slide and I look at this verse, I see a guy that is friends with someone he shouldn't be friends with that it looks like they're going to drag each other down together. So I see that in this verse and in this uh, artwork. Uh, but also see uh, being friends with the world is coveting and wanting things that do not benefit me. Yeah, I, I think what you said is right. And I mean, just from a visual standpoint, this this picture really captures, I think, the idea of light and darkness, holiness and righteousness, you know, good and evil. I mean, it's it's no coincidence that the couple sitting over there enjoying God's good provisions, they're literally in the sunlight. And then the two men that are plotting evil are behind a wall. They're hidden. They're hiding in the shadows. They're literally in the shadow. They're in the darkness, even during the daytime. And so this verse and much of this passage is highlighting kind of the di difference between good and evil. And it's a challenge to us who claim Jesus to ask the question, you know, who are we associating with? Who uh, are we following? I mean, he says, you adulterous people. That's a, that's a pretty uh, harsh word. He didn't mince words on that No, one, did he, he didn't mince words. And throughout the Bible, the relationship that God's people have with God is described in terms of a covenant relationship. It's a marriage. We're told that the church is the bride of Christ. He's our husband. We have been bound to him in covenant. And so the context of adultery is like, okay, that's a husband or a wife being unfaithful to their covenant partner. And James here, Jesus here through his brother James is poking us and saying, when we make ourselves friends of the world, which hate the Lord Jesus and hate his people, we, we commit adultery, ultimately, to the Lord. We basically say, no, we're not with you, we're with them. And that's, it's no small thing that we do whenever we pursue evil, uh, whenever we align ourselves with evil. So it, it's, it's a deep challenge to me, and I think it should be to all of us to evaluate a sense of kind of our associations. Now, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is not a call to go be a holy huddle and disappear from the world and have no influence on it and stand outside of it, condemning it, talking about how bad it is. We've seen that throughout church history. Now, what's a holy huddle? Just hanging out with church people? Yeah, just kind of like, oh, the world's a bad place. The only way to protect myself from it is to distance myself from it, to build a giant wall so that it doesn't touch me. So there's a lot of ways that, you know, the church down to the ages has talked about engaging the world around it. I think probably the most famous way, you know, taken from uh, Jesus' prayer in John, John chapter 17 is the idea of being in the world, but not of the world. So we're called to be light in the darkness, but we're called to maintain our light and to not let our light be, you know, dimmed in a sense. And so yeah, I that think, makes sense. And then the idea of therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. One of the things that always deeply challenges my own faith and relationship with the Lord is how the scripture puts forward kind of no gray area in a lot of ways. It's, hey, you're either you're on my team or you're on the world's team. You're my friend or you're my enemy. And I think the point that Jesus is often making is you can really only have one king. No real king would let you have allegiance to multiple kings, to multiple kingdoms. That, like, it's just that doesn't make any sense. 
So this idea that I can kind of have like one foot in Jesus, one foot in the world, you know, I can kind of play both sides. I can sit on the fence. Jesus is kind of going, there's no fence to sit on. <laughs> you're, you're in or you're out. You're with me or you're against me. I mean, that's even what Jesus says in much of his ministry in the Gospels. And so it's just a, it's always been a deep challenge to my own faith to consider my, uh, my devotion to the Lord, my allegiance to him. And now again, you know, we've said this every week. This is all in the context of the fact that Jesus loves us and Jesus died for us. There's grace for sinners. So every time I sin, that doesn't mean that I'm out, but it's more of a, a challenge and a call back to a continual life of repentance, identifying those places in my life, those things in my heart and in my mind that fight for allegiance to the Lord and saying to God, no, I, I want full supreme allegiance to you, the one who's loved me, the one who's laid down his life for me, the good king who's going to lead me into paths of righteousness. So for me, it's just a, it's a call to continual examination and repentance. It only comes when we know we've actually been freed from our sin. Yeah, that's a good word because you rounded that out really well. Because as we go through this, what we're going to see is the jealousness of God is going to come out. But what I hear you saying is this is why he's jealous, is either you can have him on the throne or you can have all of your stuff, which you covet on the throne. And it really comes down to he's jealous because he's loving and he wants the best thing for us. And that's why he's saying, hey, don't be adulterous, you adulterous people in verse four. So it's all about the love. And th he draws a fine line on that because he wants the best for us. And he's that's good. Right. And he's holy, which is something we haven't said probably enough in the previous slides, but that's, that's worth noting that he's holy. So thank you for that. That's it for us. Please stay tuned for an important message about the work we're doing and how you can get involved in the video Bible. We need your help. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Dave. Um, my team and I have put together a clip about something that God has put on our heart that we're very passionate about, and we'd love for you to watch it. So just stay tuned, and uh, we appreciate your consideration. So thanks. 75 million people cannot read in the United States, while 35 million more are dyslexic. That means that nearly one third of the population has limited or no access to the written Bible. How will they grow in the Lord? How are they supposed to learn more about the Bible when they have no access to it? We have a plan to address this need, and we're asking for your help. Together, we are going to illustrate every single verse in the Bible and then combine it with the biblical audio, creating the world's first video Bible. It'll be a full audio plus visual experience. Now, while this seems like it's been done before, it hasn't. There's never been a fully illustrated Bible cover to cover, verse by verse by verse. We are going to build it, and we're asking you to join us on this journey. Together, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can literally change the world. And we need over 1,000 people to give at least $20 a month. Would you please prayerfully consider giving today 